want to know what the movers and shakers of New Hampshire's performing arts are thinking? Welcome to New Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. You oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. So let's start off with the easy stuff. Um, let's talk about how you got started. So you were at, you, you were teaching for, let's go way back. Let's go way back. Okay, let's go back before that. To, yeah, to your teaching. To your Eugene O'Neill, and I'm about 12 years of age, and I'm living in New Jersey, Spring Lake Heights. Uh, I go to Point Pleasant to see a production of Beyond the Horizon by Eugene O'Neill, America's greatest playwright, in my opinion. At the time, when I was 11, I didn't know he was that good. This is my first play I've ever seen live. It's done by the uh, community players, um, and I was thunderstruck by the production. Total magic, and I never got over it. In fact, I was so profoundly affected that I kept it to myself that I wanted to be a playwright. <laughs> I never took a playwriting course in college, did take one shortly thereafter. I was just simmering, waiting to write my first play. Eventually I did. I have written close to 30 plays in my lifetime. I'll always remember Beyond the Horizon. So I'll never see another production of it because that's the one way back when I was 11 years of age. Got on a bus, went five miles to Point Pleasant on my own. I'm not sure I told anybody I was going to see that play, but what a profound influence. What, what caused you to go see that? What, why did you all of a sudden decide, I want to go see a play? I can't remember. It's too far back. But I, I can't remember. <laughs> but I can remember the impressions. And what was that play about? You it's uh, about two brothers, uh, one, uh, each. Uh, makes a bad decision. One should be on land. Uh, he goes to sea, and the one who should be a mariner remains on the land. Uh, one marries, as I recall. They're extremely unhappy. But I think it was just the fact that seeing actors on stage, memorized lines, moving, and probably today if I were to see that production, I might call it fair to middling. I don't know, I'm a lot more critical now, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I was swept into the theater. And I guess this has happened to a number of artists. Uh, as uh, young people, they're struck by something and they never get over it. Maybe they never should get over it. Did that, did that particular production make you want to see more Eugene O'Neill or just more theater in general? Or did, you, did it not even do that? Well, I did see more plays. I can't remember how many, but I certainly, I can't remember my, the second play I saw, <laughs> only the first. Um, I did encounter Eugene O'Neill in college. I wrote a master's paper about Eugene O'Neill, the longest academic paper I've ever written, I think 112 pages. Uh, dramatic repetition in three plays of Eugene O'Neill, I quite well remember the title of my master's paper. So you were so enamored with him that you actually wrote your thesis paper on him? Yes. So what was it about him or his style that, that intrigued you? I think the realism, uh, the power. Also, I should tell you that Eugene O'Neill lived for a while in Point Pleasant. And perhaps I had read something in the newspapers, the Asbury Park Press, when I was 10 or 11 referencing Eugene O'Neill, and maybe that's why I wanted to see that play. Uh, just as a tidbit, uh, a bit of trivia, um, the first play I ever had done in live theater was performed by the Pine Tree Players who produced Beyond the Horizon in Point Pleasant. Oh, that There's is sort a of an irony piece. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that play, uh, my first play was performed around 1965. It's called the weed killer. The weed killer. We'll get to that. Nothing just... about toxic substances. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, 
So your theses, I, I want to kind of stay right there for a second. Uh, what were you trying to bring out in that thesis? What, what did you find when you did your research on him that would create a hundred page document? Well, I was interested at a later age in how he created his effects. And I had read somewhere along the line that Eugene O'Neill was enamored of repetition. In fact, he once commented that the Irish repeat themselves endlessly. And of course, O'Neill was an Irishman. Uh, I had to pick something yeah. uh, to advance uh, commentary about Eugene O'Neill. Uh, maybe I was assisted by a college professor in choosing it. I know at the time I was debating whether to write a master's paper about George Bernard Shaw or Eugene O'Neill, and my advisor uh, dismissed Shaw. He said, why do you want to deal with old cabbage? <laughs> so, if he had said that about O'Neill, I probably would have written my research paper about George Bernard Shaw, but I'm glad I picked um, the American O'Neill. Are you still in love with his writings? His best plays only, Iceman Cometh, The Iceman Cometh, Long Day's Journey Into Night. I do think Long Day's Journey Into Night is the single best drama in American theater. It was produced in the 1950s. Uh, I think O'Neill died in 1953. He did not want that autobiographical play performed until several years after his death, but his widow, Colato Monterey, needed money, <laughs> and she was easily persuaded to allow a performance of that play. And that was in the mid-1950s, 56, 57, when that play was done. I did not see the original Broadway production, but I saw a wonderful production of Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey here in Raymond, New Hampshire, in Summer Theater. When was that? Because it's never hardly done anymore. Nope. Right. I would say maybe in the 1970s. And I still recall a sign at the street entrance to that theater. The Summer Theater was in maybe a third of a mile and it was mosquito infested, and yet when I saw Long Day's Journey, mosquitoes did not bother me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good deterrent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember that sign reading uh, 234 miles to Broadway. <laughs> Is that right? Is that what it said? <laughs> it said that, <laughs> and of course that was the viewpoint of the actors in that show, that they certainly wanted to get out of that. Um, jungle of mosquitoes <laughs> and get to Broadway where they'd be protected by air conditioning. Do you recall the production? Do you I recall that I was, again, uh, stunned by the power of the play. I can't remember names. All I remember that Raymond had a summer theater, Raymond, New Hampshire, for a short while, and I attended this performance of Long Day's Journey. Mm. <clears throat> a play that runs nearly four hours, by the way. Yeah, right. In production. Right. One of the reasons it's not done too often, it's so long, but O'Neill had uh, an affinity for for length. Uh, you know, he was very ambitious. He wanted to write cycle upon cycle upon cycle. Uh, some critics accused him of giganticism, if that's how it's pronounced, that word, you know, wanting to be a literary giant. Uh, anyhow, um, O'Neill has been in my life for quite a while. Uh, Did I you ever see a production of The Iceman coming? Yes, I saw that. I was in college, and a college friend and I hitchhiked from Philadelphia to New York. We saw that show. Jason Robards was the Iceman Cometh. He was Hickey. What a great actor. And uh, what a performance that was. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen too many bad productions of O'Neill, so I continue to uh, elevate him to number one spot. Well, there aren't American many people theater. willing to do it. You don't see them done. Uh, I mean, it, they're very rarely ever produced. Right. I'm not quite sure why. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so do you find, has he been an influence on your writing? I think he was initially, but again, eventually when you write 
and you write and you dig into yourself, you have your own voice, your own, you have to have your own voice. You can't mimic anyone else. Uh, you know, total imitation is suicide, as someone has commented. And I agree, if I were to slavishly imitate how O'Neill wrote or Tennessee Williams wrote, I don't think um, there'd be any kind of echo from Woodward's writings. Mm -hmm. So I do have my own voice, I think. Yeah. Do you think it's been tempered by all of these other authors? There has to be some influence, right, in the background, even maybe subconsciously? To probably. I probably am influenced by Chekhov, whom I uh, rank very highly. Mm -hmm. um, probably Shakespeare. I've taught Shakespeare, read Shakespeare, seen many Shakespeare productions in the professional theater in New York. So it's an amalgam, I suppose. Yeah. What made you decide to go into teaching? I had injured my back when I was in house construction with my dad. He was a carpenter, and builder, architect, by the way. He didn't get much credit for that, but he loved designing houses. At any rate, after working with him for several years, paying my college bills with summer employment with my dad. Uh, I happened to injure my back, pulled muscles in my back, and I remember going to a doctor who advised me to get out of the business of construction. He said, your back will never heal unless you give it a rest of something like four or five years. And with that in mind, I thought about teaching. I would never have taken a course in education in my life. Really? I consider it a badge of honor that I have it. Wow. <laughs> I learned how to teach in the classroom, um, on the firing line, as it were. Um, the thing that helped me most as a teacher was that I love students. I love young people. I love their enthusiasm, their appetite for information, for an education. Um, I have made trips with students at Southern New Hampshire University before it was SNHU. It was New Hampshire College. And for a while, for several years, every class I ever taught didn't have to be a theater class. I made theater trips with students. I drove the uh, van. Sometimes the college van rattled, and <laughs> uh, sometimes the wheels were out of alignment. I remember one funny instance where I was driving home from Portsmouth. I don't drink when I drive students. I would never do that. But the vehicle I was driving with about 15 students was weaving, and the car, the vehicle was out of alignment. And the policeman stopped me. In fact, it was near Raymond, <laughs> to go back to Raymond, New Hampshire again. And I had to get out and do the sobriety check, and the students <laughs> inside the van are laughing, they're howling, they're having so much fun uh, with my embarrassment. <laughs> but anyhow, I obviously passed the test because I wasn't had not been drinking, and then I'm hoping I can get this van back to campus if the policeman says you can't continue driving, what am I going to do with these students? I forget what the weather was like, but certainly it was around midnight, and probably not as comfortable as it would have been at high noon. Anyhow, I was allowed to continue, uh, got the students back, but I'll always remember that trip and <laughs> that mishap. <laughs> So, what did you, what did you, have you taught the same subject your whole life? I taught a lot of comp classes at Southern New Hampshire University, and again, that name was uh, claimed by the school around 2000. Uh, when I started in 1968, the school was downtown Manchester on Hanover Street. It was New Hampshire College, and it had even more than that for its title, New Hampshire College of Accounting and Commerce. And then for a while, Secretarial Sciences was thrown in. Thank goodness it was simplified to NHC. Easier to say. <laughs> so you taught composition. Um, Literature cl classes, Shakespeare for five years. I was the Shakespeare teacher at school. Uh, again, always, no matter what I taught, even public speaking, I would take students on trips. And for a while, I went to the Gould Apple Orchard Farm, and that's in, I believe, Kentucky, not too far from here in Concord. 
And why would I take students to apple picking uh, at Gould's Farm? Because the man who owned it for a while, who operated that business, loved to talk about apples. And I decided to connect my public speaking students with this man who loved to be outside chewing on an apple, spitting it here and there, as he lectured my students on the best apples that can be grown in New Hampshire. And I did it for about five years. <clears throat> the students had a chance to pick apples in the orchard. Uh, maybe some of them bought apples, but they always had a wonderful time, and the fall foliage, of course, was splendid. Yeah, yeah. I doubt the students forget their uh, memories. I certainly don't. Yeah. No, it's hard to forget that stuff. So where else did you take them? Boston? Did you ever go to Boston, New York? Boston. Uh, I made to, one trip to yeah. New York. Um, that was um, some trip. I can remember that quite well. <laughs> My sister had an apartment in New York on the uh, west side, 115 West 75th Street. It was on the fifth floor, no elevator. And about 16 or 18 of the students, I bust, I drove the bus, the small bus, down to New York City. Um, we slept on the floor. I, fortunately, being um, close to my sister, <laughs> I had the right to sleep in the single bed that was there. <laughs> the rest of the students were on the floor or close to the floor in chairs. And of course, nobody slept well. We were excited, and of course, people snore. <laughs> and so we were rather tired, but we saw a musical Friday night. Oh, excuse me, we did not see a musical. We saw a play of mine that was produced and directed by Theater 76, a group that no longer exists, an off-Broadway group, but they did a play of mine at New York University Theater. We saw that Friday, and then Saturday afternoon we saw a musical. Some students did. Um, uh, some of us saw a Faith, The Faith Healer, a play by Brian Friel, which is a brilliant play. Um, and then uh, Sunday we saw The Harry Eight, a production um, of a Eugene O'Neill play, a powerful play. And that was the highlight of the weekend. That was an extraordinary production again by the master playwright Eugene O'Neill. Have you ever directed plays yourself? Over 50 productions I've directed at this you school. Have. Yes. You have. You mm have. -hmm. Um, students themselves in the play or outside? Mostly students, yeah. but again, people from the community. Uh, though in one season, I think I directed over 15 productions. Usually they were shorter plays, but you know, this was an obsession of mine. In fact, when I stopped advising the drama club, I had the shakes in a way when I wasn't directing any longer. I was so uh, in need of directing a play. I was so thrilled always to be moving through a script and guiding students when they needed guidance. Again, I think that several students who participated in the New Hampshire College Drama Club, their fondest memories would have to be of the theater. Is mine are. Yeah. <laughs> so, which came first, the um, the writing or the directing? Well, I wrote first. Uh, to go back to that day in January, and I forget the year, but anyhow, work was slow. My dad uh, usually retired from construction for a couple of weeks in January or February. Ice cold, you don't have a house that has been enclosed, a structure that's been enclosed. So he would stay in and I decided it was time for me to start writing a play. I had nurtured this ambition and yet was so afraid to take paper and pen and sit down and steel myself to a chair and start a script. Now how old were you at this time? I think I was in, I was out of college so at about 22, 23 years of age. And I remember telling my parents at breakfast in the kitchen that I was going up to my sister's room. My sister was away sailing on a ship and her bedroom was free. She's the one that had the apartment in New York. 
so she wasn't home that often. But her bedroom was free, and why would they choose it? Because it had the only desk in the house. And I remember going up the steps uh, and determined to write, and I sat down for two or three hours, nothing on paper, nothing. I was nearly paralyzed. I came down at lunch and told my parents honestly I had written nothing. But I tried to do the same thing the next day, make the same effort, and finally words began to appear on paper. And that's literally, emphasizing literally, the way I studied as a playwright. So walk me through um, this process because I'm not a writer. What, what, you, you wanted to write a play, but you didn't have something in mind already, apparently, right? Because you're waiting for words? Or did you have an idea, but didn't know how to frame it? I think the latter is the, the truth of it. Again, so many people you meet at parties, or conferences, they have um, an idea for a play, an idea for a novel. And I guess most of them will never sit down to execute um, that idea, put it on paper, as it were. Um, no, how do you how do you write a play? Uh, again, when I was living up here in New Hampshire, early in my teaching career, the Palace Theater uh, contacted me. They heard my theater activity on campus at NHC, and I was offered money to write a play honoring or celebrating our bicentennial. So this would be back in 1976. Um, I was going to write a play about the uh, murder of uh, Jane McCrae, uh, a rather sensational story. Uh, murdered by Native Americans, ambushed, etc. Um, I even made a journey up to where she had been waiting for her future husband. Um, I went to the spot where it's claimed she was waylaid and murdered, um, scalped. Um, and then I went to my desk back in New Hampshire, uh, Manchester, and again, how do I write a history play? I was overwhelmed, I couldn't write it. And I finally had to inform the Palace Theater that I couldn't do it, didn't know how to do it. So it is a matter of learning, learning how to do it. Today, I think I can safely say if I had this assignment, I would be able to knock it off in three months. I would, if I had three months of um, time reserved to write a history play, a two-act play even, I could do it. Hmm. What was your first play about? That one that day? The that Weed you Killer. You? The Weed Killer. It was about Is this the one, did you, the one you wrote in your sister's room at the desk? Yes, that's the one that I wrote there, and I wrote a couple of other plays and at her desk as well. But The Weed Killer is about a young man who goes to uh, the Naval Academy and he finds himself in a cheating scandal. He himself is not a cheater, but the conflict is should he report the dishonesty of people around him his age who are aiming to get a commission? Um, should he honor this so-called code of silence or should it be the code of honesty? And so that's the debate in him and he does reveal names and my play is about the repercussions, what follows the pressure on him, this young man, when he is, um, when he's declared uh, his own honesty by naming people who would cheat. And of course, we've heard of scandals at the Air Force Academy, West Point, on and on it goes. Um, I guess uh, they'll always be cheating always by always be insiders trying to get the advantage and there's who are on the outside anyhow that's the play that was performed by the pine tree players my very first performance in a live theater
Did you direct it? I did not direct it. A New York director professional was hired. By the pine tree? Yes. Um, I contributed a little bit of money toward the production because, again, they were taking a chance on me, an unknown playwright. And Pine Tree had never done a play, an original play before. It was always something that they felt could be safe, that it would attract an audience. Uh, my script was the very first to be an original endeavor. And it ran for two weekends in December 1965, I think was the year. And I remember the leading critic for the Esbury Park Press, Barry Robinson was his name. I don't know if he's living today or not. But I remember his, um, his review. And he did not particularly like the production. Uh, he probably should not have liked it because it wasn't a very good play. But what he said at the end is something that was important to me. He said, I understand that the playwright works in home construction. I hope he gets out of it and pursues a career as a playwright in theater. That's incredible kudos. Yes, that was a wonderful send-off, as it were. Wow. And again, good critics see potential. And the difference between a good critic and a bad critic in so many instances is that the, um, well, I wouldn't say a bad critic, critic but a mediocre critic, um, only examines what is before him or her and the good critic sees the potential. What could happen if this is changed, if this is altered? And Barry Robinson, I guess, was able to see some promise in this fledgling script. What was it like to see your first play be produced? It was wonderful for my parents and aunts and uncles and all my family gathered around me, uh, I remember being in the Spring Lake Community Playhouse. It's a lovely little playhouse. And <clears throat> I often had never, I mean, I had not seen some of my relatives, my aunts and uncles ever dressed up. And here they are in the theater. Uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a rather um, warm family reunion. And I don't know whether they liked the play or not, but they persevered. They didn't leave until the curtain was down, the final curtain. Were you nervous for the production? I don't think I was nervous. I was just excited. Excited that this was happening. And I didn't envision any career in the theater. I knew I was going to continue writing plays. But it's wonderful to have a first production, obviously. Yeah. It yeah. substantiates uh, some of your your effort. When you watched the, sh the production, that particular one, and, and especially since it was your first, were you pleased with the way they they portrayed your, how do I put this, um, your conception, right? So you have an idea as you put it on paper. Were they able to translate that properly? I think so. I think the actors um, did a good job. The director from New York was a rather cold fish. I think he was uh, showboating. Uh, for him, this was a, an exercise to get money. I don't think he was enamored of the production or enamored of the script. I can't uh, for sure say. I know that some people in the cast didn't care for him, his method of directing, but Anyhow, I did like the cast, the members of the cast, very much. And one continued to be a friend of mine for years. She's still living, uh, suffering cancer now, unable, oh, mm -hmm. nearly bedridden, and living in uh, Massachusetts. Um, she, by the way, uh, eventually did a one-character play that I wrote about Gertrude Stein. That was done around 2002, 2003, at Southern New Hampshire University, and it was a rousing success. I got great reviews for that production, and she had spent a year studying Gertrude Stein and my script. Um, and she did quite a job, that actress. Did she em help you embellish it? Did it need to change at all, your original script? She didn't script? change the dialogue. She simply brought the spirit of Gertrude Stein as she had been able to divine that spirit. 
Sandra Dubo is the professional name of my friend Sandra. And she lived in New Jersey at the time. She gave me perhaps the greatest encouragement as we were going through that production of The Weed Killer. And she kept assuring me that I had potential because I could make an audience laugh. It was Sandra's opinion that the best sound in any theater production is not applause, because that can be perfunctory, but it's laughter, spontaneous laughter. Mm -hmm. So the audience is with you. And I guess there had been, there were maybe four or five funny lines in that weed killer, probably unintentional, but the audience laughed. And Sandra thought that that was a good sign that I could make it in the theater as a playwright. Were you teaching at the time as well? That, that no, not you, back then. Okay. Uh, teaching be began when I was about 30 years of age. Uh, oh, just a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Only yesterday, as they say. <laughs> Only yesterday. Um, so you get the first one under your belt. Um, did you immediately think, okay, I, I think I can, this is going to be a pretty cool uh, vocation or whatever, hobby at the time. Um, and then did you set out to write another one right away or did it take time for you to come back to the table and with another idea? No, I think I advanced into uh, writing uh, my next play, which was Love Letters in Spain, was the title of the play. That was also eventually performed not by a theater company. I think the director hired a, uh, a cast at her expense because she was, uh, she supported my writing. Uh, her name was Carol Scott, and I have no idea whether Carol is living today. Uh, she had a daughter, Lisa Scott, who is uh, precocious, uh, age 14 going on 30. She was that kind of person. And I don't know how they heard of me. Maybe it was the publicity that followed the weed killer. But Carol contacted me and said that she wanted to direct anything that I had. Well, I had to write two more plays, uh, two short plays, one act plays, and one was Love Letters in Spain. Uh, I can't remember what the second play was. So I guess it wasn't very good if I can't remember the title. <laughs> Anyhow, she did that. and. After the production, she called me. She lived maybe 15 miles from where I lived with my parents at home in Spring Lake Heights. I think she was in Ocean Township. And she called and she invited me to dinner at her place. And so I went down and had dinner. And after we finished our repast, she eyed me, uh, stared at me until I had to ask, well, what's wrong? <laughs> She said, I want you to go to California with me. <laughs> um, I laughed as I'm laughing now, <laughs> nervously laughing. And she said, I believe in your writing and I want to be on the bandwagon when you make it. That's why I'm, I'll pay all your expenses. You come out with my daughter and me. I'm leaving this area because I know people in California. That's where I grew up. And so I'm returning to that site. I probably should have gone, but instead I said no. What was your... I wanted to stay with my parents and continue working with my dad. I was very close to my father. In the construction business? Yes. Which your doctor told you not to do. Right. I think that accident, though, occurred after this. Oh. My back accident, oh. yeah. So anyhow, if I were to go back and had a chance again to answer Carol Scott, I would say, okay, I will go. And if I don't like it, I'll come back after yeah. four or five months. I should have gone. It's that road I didn't take. Uh -huh. And I think probably for the rest of my life, um, I will wonder, should I have gone to California to make a name for myself? You need to write that play. Well, again, Carol, I think, was interested in, in screenplays. She was interested in movies and television. I don't know if I could have made a successful shift to writing for movies. I've written, 
a couple of screenplays, and I much prefer the theater. I prefer the freedom. Um, my understanding is that you write a script for Hollywood, and if it's liked at all, it, it's appropriated, it's not yours anymore. If you're a playwright and you write something, it's your property. Uh, you cannot be disabused of your intellectual property. It's yours. Mm -hmm. But there are so many stories of Hollywood studios seizing property um, with the permission of the authors and changing the scripts, uh, tearing apart the framework, altering the characters. Well, if I go to the great effort of writing a play, I don't know that I want my characters very much mutilated. Uh, they're my characters in a way I have to protect them. Yeah. I had a friend in here a couple of weeks ago who knows the film industry really well. And that was one of the stories which he told where once you hand off a screenplay or, or have written something, it can now go through four different hands, mm -hmm. all who can alter the, pl the, right. the production. Right, they have the freedom to do that, yeah. and they take that right. liberty. Right. right, so the director will take it, and they'll put their uh, impetus on it, or, yeah. or, you know, and then the editor will take it, and he'll edit it a certain way to, right. you know, and so it may never look like what you handed them. Right. Which is really sad. And we have the Dramatist Guild in this country. It was formed early in the 20th century. I'm currently not a member, but I have been a member for several years, and I think I'll rejoin that group because I have a brand new play, and I, if I have that any kind of production down in New York, off off Broadway or better off Broadway, it needs to be protected, and the Dramatist Guild does protect playwrights. Uh, what is their function? I'm not a the Dramatist uh, Guild. Well. Before it was formed, plays were, I guess, pirated, stolen. There was no uh, financial penalty for the, th for the thieves. Um, I guess it was um, mayhem for the playwrights. There was no copyright so, protection, no intellectual or property sca protection. Well, scanty, I think. It wasn't uh, very ironclad. And again, so many loopholes. Um, at any rate, that Dramatist Guild was uh, formed. I think Robert Sherward was one of the early founders. About five or six playwrights who banded together, got legal advice, and out of that came the Dramatist Guild, which is located on Broadway in New York City. Um, they're <clears throat> in a rather high building on Broadway. I can't remember now the address. But it's interesting, I've actually had a production, um, again, to go back to Gertrude Stein and my friend who performed that one act play, play so brilliantly. Uh, we did that show for <clears throat> the benefit of agents. It was done in New York City one night and we had one critic coming. Again, I've learned that if you want something done in New York, Usually you have to get a critic to come and attend the show. You can muster a modest production, but it's not gonna go anywhere if you don't have critics coming and then later commenting uh, on that play. And if it's a good review, you have a chance uh, that that play will move to a, a better location in New York City. Anyhow, the one critic who promised to come <laughs> turned up sick. <laughs> that is, he didn't turn up at the theater. He, just, <laughs> he sent a representative who didn't take any notes. I don't know who that person was. I remember being introduced to him. But I also noticed he never took a note during the show. It was a fine production because others um, praised it. And so nothing was written about that play about Gertrude Stein. That's a shame. Yeah. That's a shame. Two Suits in One Act is the title of that play, by the way. Two Suits? Two Suits in One Act. It tries to pick up the apparent illogicality of Gertrude Stein's writing. Two Suits in One Act. <laughs> it's a bit of a zany play. I want to go back a little bit more to 
your early years, how writing is not necessarily easy. And writing a play, which has certain structure to it, um, that adds another level of complexity. It's not like you're just writing a stream of consciousness here. You're, you actually have to abide by certain mm -hmm. rules. So you write your first one, um, and then you write the, the, the next two, which are the one acts, right? The, how are you seeing yourself evolve as a writer? What, what were you getting from the early ones? And you're like, okay, that wasn't maybe correct there. I couldn't, I can change the, the way that the characters evolve here. Or was there, could you see yourself evolving as a writer? Uh, yes, over a period of time, I could feel that development. If I had to chronicle a year when I really felt that I had become part of the family of playwrights in America, that I had become an associate of Edward Albee, <laughs> of O'Neill, of Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, that these were if not my co-equals, my friends, acquaintances in the theater. It was, I think, in 1979 or so, I had my first sabbatical from school. I was down in New Jersey in the family home by myself. Uh, my mother had died a year before, and my father had been dead for five or six years, and I was in the family home for the entire year. I had a sabbatical for one year, and I wrote a play called Realimators, a play about Henry David Thoreau, my favorite nonfiction writer in American literature. And that play, when I finished, I felt that I had become an American playwright. That play um, was eventually performed at the summer meeting of the Thoreau Society and got a standing ovation. Again, one of the highlights of my lifetime as a playwright. Everybody around me at the end of Realimators uh, stood up and there was a clarion call, playwright, playwright, author, author. And I shrunk in my chair, I didn't want to stand up and receive this applause. It wasn't that I thought I wasn't worthy of it, it was just overwhelming. <laughs> and so as I'm sliding into my chair, as I'm sliding now, uh, the curator of the Thoreau Society in Concord, Massachusetts, who knew me and was a friend of mine, spotted me. Charles, Charles, stand up, stand up. What choice did I have? <laughs> and I stood in, again, thunderous ovation. And I knew I'd become an American playwright. Did you know as you were writing that play that it would be so well received? Could no, I no? have no idea. You, again, you never know when you finish a script, is it any good? Uh, probably the worst time for me when I'm writing a play is at the very beginning. And that first draft is uh, <laughs> not much better than a rag sheet. Uh, the characters are ill-formed, uh, lines, and are cluttered in the mouths of the characters. Again, it's in co-it, it's fragmentary, it isn't together. And the only thing to do is to stay at your chair and you keep writing a second draft, a third draft. And I usually come close to what is the finished product in my third draft. But again, this is weeks, months of work, waking up in the middle of the night, thinking about the script, waking up in the morning tired, but still going to the desk and writing. And then, of course, the whole thing changes when the characters come alive and they start speaking for themselves. And then it becomes near ecstasy. Do you, do you like to hear, before the final draft, do you like to hand it off to, say, a, a, a group of people who will verbally read it out loud, like a staged reading, so you get 
you can hear the characters' voices uh, like maybe you wanted them to be? Uh, uh, I did that when I took workshops in New York City. I've taken two workshops and paid for them. One was the Roger Simon uh, studio in New York City. Uh, again, when I was in New Jersey, it wasn't that difficult to get up to New York City and regularly uh, attend a workshop. And then I attended the HB workshop, rather well known in New York, on the west side. Um, these are the only two schools I've attended for instruction in playwriting. Was I helped uh, very much by these workshops? I don't know, because I didn't take them early in my career. I took them when I was writing when there was momentum in my playwriting career. So I don't know whether I was um, greatly uh, affected by these workshops, but I'm glad I took them because it's always nice to be around theater people. And they read my material and made comments. Um, again, I never um, hand my script over to anybody until it's finished. And that's why, basically, I don't take workshops because the idea is that you write a page, two pages, and then you submit it to the group for commentary. I don't want interference in my work. I don't want other fingerprints. Again, I don't think it's healthy for me to give an unfinished script to anyone. And I do clutch these scripts. I keep them dearly to myself. And then when I write the end on that final page, then I'm willing to share that script with anyone else. But it's close to the best until that happens. So I'm not a champion <coughs> of group discussions of my work when my work is in progress. Mm. That is popular in this country today. Um, a lot of playwrights go to schools, go to workshops, and do have actors and actresses reading their material. Okay, so <clears throat> you've written how many plays? 30, so over 30? Uh, close to 30, and the reason I'm not precise about that is that I go back to scripts and revise them. Uh, <laughs> it must be close to 30. And if it's not 30, it's close to 20. <laughs> so, but I've not written 50. <laughs> yeah, okay. So some must stand out more than others, either, either as, well, it could be for anything, you know, you, this is the one you're the most proud of, although maybe it hasn't received the accolades that you think it should, or this one has received a tremendous amount of accolades, and, uh, or this one needs more work, but, the, but there's something that delineates them in your mind. So which of the ones at this point are you are you the most proud of and then which ones as you look back would you maybe like to take another look at and that you think have a second life or a second chance well some of my plays i know are dismally bad <laughs> there's one play a war on coot cockerel and <laughs> i wrote that play because of someone in Spring Lake Heights, New Jersey, who lived in a house that was condemned, refused to leave, finally fled when they were, uh, when the town was bringing equipment to demolish the house. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, he fled and was never seen again. Is this but a true story? He went. True story, yeah. So you based the play off that? His name was Cottrell. <laughs> and my title of my play is The War on Coot Cottrell. Uh, his first name was not Coot, but I think Coot's an appropriate name. Uh, there was no plumbing in the house, I guess some heating. Um, and when they were demolishing the house, I wasn't present. I was down in New Jersey, but I was working with my dad that day. But the word got out, Spring Lake Heights is a small town, and this was a... Uh, Cockpool was rather a notorious character. He didn't hurt anybody, but his living style was bizarre. And as they were demolishing the house, the story goes, what I heard, the winds were blowing. Don't they blow when there's dust in the air? And all kinds of pornography blowing in the wind. <laughs> Coot Cottrell. So I had to write a play about him, but it's a lousy play, and I'll tell you why. I did not have my ending. 
I have learned in my years as a playwright, if you don't have your ending, your play is going to have trouble. And it will be trouble for an audience. You have to know where you're going, somehow how you're going to land, because how do you set up the foreshadowing? How do you... How do you coax an audience toward the end, uh, almost force them to the ending, if you don't have uh, clues, uh, suggestions, etc., to get them there? And so, no ending in sight, then how can you get there? And I've told that to my playwriting students so many years at Southern New Hampshire. University. I asked them to write short plays because I know a hard play, a long play would be very hard for them to write. So a short play, still have to have the ending. Have to have the ending. Do you coax them to have the ending? Yes. In fact, I even asked Begin them to bring the in endings. Yeah, you do. I had to look at the endings to make sure they had them. Um, so important. Uh, I think it was. Um, Catherine Ann Porter, the short story writer, I know it was she who commented that she would never start any fiction without knowing absolutely her ending. She had to have it. It's funny you mention that. I, I watch, no, not anymore, but um, shows like Saturday Night Live, which are skit driven, they have a terrible time trying to finish skits. Mm. The, and it's uncomfortable almost. They they have a kernel of an idea for a joke, and they kind of build a skit around it, and then the ending just falls flat because they mm. can't they can't close it. Yeah, it's too improvisational, perhaps. And again, without having an ending at the outset, you probably are not going to um, get to that ending, that proper destination. Now, interestingly enough, the coot did have in real life. There was an ending. Right. <laughs> he disappeared. <laughs> but you couldn't weave that in, huh? You couldn't... Well, it's just that I was early in my playwriting career. It was an ambitious effort. It was a long two-act play. And I just didn't have the capacities and the capabilities at the time. It's just a case of lacking, not confidence, just I didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's... Um, a script that I um, would probably call it my worst play, um, and no one reads it. I don't want to read it. I keep <laughs> copies only for the sake of the museum, <laughs> the Wilbert Museum, but I don't uh, care for that play at all. But to go so to the other yes, way, thank and, you. and that would be my uh, play, my one-act play about Henry David Thoreau, Ray Elementor's. I've written two other plays since about Thoreau, and I've written a long screenplay about Thoreau. Again, uh, Realimeters probably is my single best play. It's the most powerful. It's about loss, about grief, and who amongst us is so lucky as to escape grief? Yeah. We all have it. And this is a play that Henry, um, about Henry David Thoreau and the loss of his brother, whom he idolized. Uh, John Thoreau died of lockjaw, a terrible, terrible way to is die. Is he the one who got rust from a blade, a razor blade? He was um, stropping his razor and uh, the razor slipped and it nicked his ring finger. He was dead 10 days later of lockjaw. And his personal nurse, the one who was with him, Henry, his younger brother, by two and a half years, and John died in Henry's arms. And Henry Thoreau could never get over it. Who amongst us could? And it's my thesis that Henry Thoreau wrote his first book at Walden Pond, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, in memory of John. <clears throat> That's the book that Henry had to write. And in my play, Realimators, Henry has gone to the Concord Railroad Station, a little station back then, in 1853 in October of, to collect the unsold copies of his book. The book is a financial failure, and more than 700 copies, many unbound, come back in boxes. They're left at the station. 
Henry starts putting them in his father's wheelbarrow and he's going to wheel them to Walden Pond to the site where Henry had his uh, cabin and Henry intends to bury them and he's intercepted by a man named Dodd older than Henry by several years and it turns out that Dodd's own son is dying of lockjaw at that time and Dodd in his misery in his confusion seeks out Henry David Thoreau or perhaps Henry can somehow help him because Henry lost his brother to lockjaw and these two men meet before Henry can bury his books out there in the woods and it's a powerful play. This is a one act? A one act play. It sounds like it could very easily be a full length play. Have you thought about? Well, I'm not sure I, I mean, there's a what lot I could there. do about this because again, some of the power is, it's condensed, it's contracted and I'm not sure that a, an extended two act play would be good for this subject. And anyhow, it's been successful as a one act. I'm mm -hmm. willing to let it go at that. Yeah. I have written a two act play about Henry David Thoreau called The Only Remedy for Love. And that's about Henry and John when they were courting the same woman in love, head over heels as the cliche goes, in love with Ellen Sewell. And they are competing for her. And that actually happened. It happened, of course, before 1842 in January when John uh, nicked his ring finger and then died of lockjaw. Has that play been produced? It's been given a stage reading at my school. It has not been produced. It's never been produced. I wish it were uh, in line to be produced somewhere. Uh, How do you think it ranks against the one act? Realimitas is a better play. It's more powerful. The only remedy for love, a lot of comic touches in it, the awkwardness of the two brothers competing. Ellen is only something like 17 years old in a few months, and she's confused by this sudden attention of the two boys. Ellen lives in Situate. Um, her aunt lives in the boarding house that Mrs. Thoreau, Henry's mother, runs. And that's how in that summer, in that July, um, 1839, that Ellen comes to Concord, and the two brothers simply can't resist her. They are totally in love with her after the first day. And they're, they do compete um, against each other. Uh, this is not simply uh, brotherly love spilling over and each uh, affording the other the opportunity to advance, they, they compete. And that's partly what the play is about. Did Thoreau ever end up with her? She rejected both boys. <laughs> <laughs> At her father's <laughs> instruction, her father was a Unitarian minister who thought that Henry and John Thoreau were caught up in transcendentalism and were not fit to marry her, his daughter. Um, Henry was a transcendentalist, John was not, so the father had it only half right. Um, but it's a true story. Very few people know much about that episode in Henry's life. Of course, people who write books about Henry Thoreau and plays about Henry Thoreau would know about this episode. Yeah. Are almost all of your plays written on historical figures? I would say most of them are. Uh, the play that I recently finished, it took me two years to do, and the school was very nice to me. Uh, Southern New Hampshire University gave me a course reduction <clears throat> each year so that for two years so that I could do this play, Fitzgerald at Your Service. I would rank this play in terms of the successful playwriting to be up there with my best. It doesn't have the power of realimators, but the characters are, for me, engaging. It's about F. Scott Fitzgerald. 
But Fitzgerald never appears, only his photograph when he's 40 years of age. And it's a play about uh, a gathering of aficionados, people who love Fitzgerald at St. Paul, out in St. Paul, Minnesota, where Fitzgerald grew up. He was born in St. Paul, grew up in St. Paul. A man named Leon Wilson, a New Hampshire playwright, goes to this conference. He has offered a play, a short play about Fitzgerald that's going to be performed by an actress. He has not met her. Her name is Judy Jones, and she believes that she is the character that Leon Wilson has written about Judy Jones. Judy Jones is a character in F. Scott Fitzgerald's short story entitled Winter Dreams. So here, Leon Wilson, who thinks that he has total command of this character, as he's put her in his play, his one-act play, uh, the actress is defiant, and all of this is going on, and in the background is a bartender who has just won a look-alike competition, the person who best resembles F. Scott Fitzgerald. It turns out that this bartender thinks that he is F. Scott Fitzgerald. And so what is to happen <laughs> when there's an attempt at a dress rehearsal with a bartender <laughs> who thinks that he is F. Scott Fitzgerald and is very eager to correct any false impressions, any factual errors of Leon Wilson, the playwright, and Judy Jones, the actress. And so these three have a go at it in the first act. And in the second act, a 97-year-old woman appears who has had personal contact with F. Scott Fitzgerald. And so what a mix it all turns out to be. And at the end, the end is a moment of radiance when these four characters who have a such affection for F. Scott Fitzgerald that overrides their differences and they blend as one. It's like a family portrait at the end. What, what prompted you to write this? I went out to St. Paul to visit my daughter who lives in St. Paul. This was back maybe in 2016. I'd go out every summer to see her. She lives out there with her husband and child. Um, my daughter wants me to meet two people who belong to the Fitzgerald Society, Mel and Stu. We go to a restaurant in downtown St. Paul, sort of a patio restaurant. It's called Frost, uh, the Frost Restaurant. Very nice, beautiful day in mid-June. The waiter comes over to the, our table, and I have been given a small booklet by Mel and Stu to greet me in coming to St. Paul. They know that I've taught Fitzgerald in my literary classes at school at SNHU. And on this little booklet on the cover is a picture of Scott Fitzgerald. And I'm looking at this picture, and the waiter comes over, and I look up at the waiter, and they look awfully similar. And I keep looking at the photograph of Fitzgerald on the book, and I look at this waiter, impeccably attired, and I ask him, are you related to F. Scott Fitzgerald? No. <laughs> uh, he replies. Uh, and then I don't know what got in me, but I said, I'd like to win a play about F. Scott Fitzgerald with you in mind. And he continued to take our order, <laughs> <laughs> somewhat dismissing as a lunatic. Anyhow, before I left that restaurant, I had... Um, promised this unknown person. All I know is his first name is Patrick. I promised that I'd write a play and I'd come back the next year and seek him out if he were still working at this restaurant. And uh, again, he seemed somewhat bewildered at my eagerness to write a play with, with him in mind. But I came back to New Hampshire and I wrote the play. I wrote a one act, took it out, it was given a stage reading 
at one of the historic places, the university club where F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda, his wife, often danced and frolicked. Fitzgerald even lived there for a while uh, when he was on his own. <clears throat> um, the people who attended that stage reading in St. Paul liked to play a great deal, and some people said, why don't you write a second act? We want a second act. So I did. <laughs> I listened to audiences. I try to. I should. And so now I have, and I'm touching it now. I'm holding it up. Hold up that Fitzgerald camera. Fitzgerald right at your service. A play in two acts by Charles Wilbur. How many pages is it? 2019. It is 77 pages, I believe. How many people in the cast? Five. Five. Do you see any problem in casting someone that has to look like Fitzgerald or have a Well, I think, yes, we can have someone who is uh, 350, 400 pounds playing Fitzgerald. In fact, I specify in the script... Is that how big he was? I know nothing no, about No, Fitzgerald it. was 5'7", and at the age of 40, he was 150 pounds. Oh. So the person playing Fitzgerald would have to look a bit like him. Uh, I think makeup maybe could do the rest, but it certainly someone would have to look a bit like him to play the uh, the bartender. And of course the part of the play is the bartender's realization eventually that he's not literally F. Scott Fitzgerald, but he actually thinks that Fitzgerald's in him, growing in him and taking over. Does he, <laughs> does he say why he feels that way? Well, how did he come about thinking that he was Fitzgerald. He grew up in St. Paul. His last name is Fitzgerald, although his first name is Patrick. Uh, he has gone to the same academy that F. Scott Fitzgerald went to, taken the same walks on Summit Street, a famous street in St. Paul, a mile of Victorians, gorgeous houses, um, well known in that area of America. Um, he has read everything written about Fitzgerald. He's become a so-called walking encyclopedia. Has he written anything? Not written anything. Okay. And that's one of the differences. That's one of the reasons he couldn't become F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Patrick Fitzgerald, my character, is fascinated by numbers, particularly the number 14. That has some relevance? To it does in the script, but again, uh -huh. you'd have to see the play, read yeah. the play, to know how 14 becomes a factor. <laughs> but uh, Patrick Fitzgerald said that like a star that appears in the heavens for a while, it dominates, it appears and then recedes. So certain numbers come to the forefront and they dominate. And so Patrick Fitzgerald has this thing about numbers that F. Scott Fitzgerald had about words, the magic of words. Did you have any difficulty going from the one act to the, the broader length? No, I didn't. No, because I realized I had enough thrust in the first act. Plus, a woman is mentioned, this 97-year-old woman is mentioned. She's 95 um, for the time period of the first act. And she she's a factor. She does not appear, but she is mentioned. She's a factor in act one. And then in Act Two, she appears near the end. And again, should I allow her to have dialogue because she's going to take over, is she not? And so I have to make her mute. She's had a stroke, she can't speak. Interesting. And so the characters that I've developed in Act One, they continue to hold the stage by speaking. They dominate the stage because they speak. She cannot speak, but again, they read from her notebook, and they know why she's there or what she craves to do. She had the stroke maybe some six months before she meets these um, people we know in Act One. So anyhow, already the play's been read by four or five people. It's gotten nice praise from them. One woman told me she was riveted from Act, in Act One, page one, she was riveted. So I've sent the script off to a friend in New York City. She lives actually in Winchester County, but she goes into New York 
She knows <clears throat> theater producers, and my hope is that she'll hand the script to one of the producers. Has she received it already? She received it Monday. Has she read it, do you know? <coughs> she read the first act when I sent it to her two years ago, the first act. Oh, okay. So has she been eager to receive it? Has she been... Uh, I don't think Lisa Snow is her name. I don't think she, you know, keeps that close in contact with me. She's a, my, my wife's friend, and they have con phone conversations. But anyhow, Lisa responded Tuesday by saying she looked forward to reading the second act. And I assume if she likes the script sufficiently that she will uh, manage to get it into the hands of a would-be producer in New York. She does know them. She works with some of them. So, uh, the people who have read it, any locals? Yes, Elaine, uh, what is her last name? She's working with my wife now on a production my wife is doing. She's a playwright, too. She's doing a series of one-act plays. She's written several, I think something like nine. Her plays are medical educational, a totally different focus from my plays, which are meant to entertain. Not much more than that, maybe. Maybe occasionally inform, enlighten. And Elaine <clears throat> has, um, she teaches in Boston. Uh, knows a lot about architecture, is an architect, architect herself, and, uh, culturally um, well-informed. An artist? An artist, and she loves this play. Uh, my wife loved it when she read it. Uh, a couple of other people who read my material. Uh, Ken, a screenwriter and playwright, um, had only good things to say about it. So armed with this early uh, support, uh, swelling support, I mailed the script, hard copy script to Lisa Snow. She now has it, it's in her hands. And again, something that is substantial, like a hardcover copy, is so much more to it than something electronic that is transmitted via the computer. And who knows if any playwright's going to bother to look at it. But I think producers in New York, and they're I hope they're looking for material all the time and looking backward at something that was performed 30, 40 years ago and trying to resurrect it. So I'm optimistic that Fitzgerald at your service might be done in New York next year. Mm, that would be wonderful. Yes. Um, have you thought about having it pitched at the Hat Box or any place local? I did two plays at the Hat Box. I think it was an excellent production. It was a play about a, a double bill. Again, there was the Gertrude Stein play that was performed by another actress. She did a brilliant job, oh, Amy. Yes, I remember. And then there was a play about Thornton Wilder, a one-act play, dealing with the mental illness of Thornton Wilder's sister. Most people don't know about Thornton Wilder's family. They assume that everything was um, was felicitous. That he had a fine upbringing. Very few people know that his father browbeat his children, harangued them, um, caused a lot of maladjustment, and one of the results was the mental illness of Car of Charlotte um, Thornton's uh, sister. His uh, sister closest to him in age. He had several sisters, and so this play is about. Thornton Wilder dealing with his sister, she confronts him in a theater and attacks his play Our Town. He's currently performing in Our Town for two weeks. Um, that actually happened, by the way. Thornton Wilder always wanted to act, and he's playing the stage manager in Our Town for two weeks while the man who had that lead is on vacation. So Charlotte confronts Thornton and they have a Donny book of an exchange, a powerful play. I would say that might be my second most powerful play after Reanimators in terms of sheer emotion, how an audience is stared up. Now this was done at the Hatbox as well. Done at right? the Hatbox, 
well received? Maybe three years ago, and yes, very well received. I wish a critic had turned up to put it in the paper. Yeah. But again, standing ovations. In some instances, it ran six performances, two weekends. Uh, why would I go back to the hat box? Well, it's an ideal theater for me, but Brenda and I, my Brenda, my wife, we've established a schoolhouse players, a theater company, and we ended up giving more than half of our money to the hat box so we could do the show there. You don't make money. <laughs> and again, I, at my age, I'm in a hurry to make it. <laughs> and I don't think a New Hampshire production is sufficient for a New Hampshire playwright. Yeah. I have to stretch and touch New York. Or at least Boston. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Is this play a um, something that you you had been wanting to do for a long time? How did this come? Did it just Miss Fitzgerald? Yeah, yeah. No, it came when I looked at that waiter. Really? I can't believe I wrote a play. I spent two years writing a play. In my reaction to this man in a black suit, white shirt, so impeccably attired as a bartender and waiter, he's actually a bartender as well. Um, and when I went back. Ooh, two years later, with this script, I intended to give him a copy of my when I play. I couldn't track him down. Nobody knew where he was, although they remembered him. And his first name is Patrick. I don't have his last name. Uh, maybe if I go back uh, this summer, uh, next summer, I should say, in 2020, I'll go to the... Uh, <laughs> go to the Commodore Hotel where he is or was working as a bartender. Um, he makes wonderful uh, gin and tonics. <laughs> he made one for me. It's the best I ever had in my life. Really? Really? <laughs> so he does have talent as a bartender, and he has no idea that just standing in the sun taking our order in this outside patio restaurant, the Frost Restaurant in St. Paul, downtown St. Paul, that I was in a sense immortalizing him in this play. Yeah. I mean, he has no idea. <laughs> that would be a wonderful backstory if this ever does take off in New York. It's yes, and then I think people would have to track that man down. Yeah, and yeah. Put him on the um, a morning show and he would be there. Yeah. Maybe I'd be next to him and <laughs> it would be funny. So how many other plays have you done in New York? Have you had performed yes, in Yes, I've had productions in New York. In fact, Reelimeters. The Thoreau play was done at Lincoln Center, the second stage theater. I rush to tell you that it's not the first stage, it's the second stage. Uh, the Roger Simon group that I mentioned earlier who gave instruction, they also offered playwrights the opportunity to have the work done at Lincoln Center if Roger Simon thought the work was good enough and Reelimators was done there. And one of the great compliments I got in my life as a playwright, I'll never forget it, I was there in the audience at the Second Theater in Lincoln Center, and after the performance, a man who was, again, wonderfully attired, he was the best dressed gentleman in the audience, and he starts coming toward me, and I'm thinking, New York producer, this is a New York producer, oh, please, be it a New York producer. And he comes up, and it's better than that, he says, do you have anything else going on in New York? I want to see it. And I told him no. And he left. Oh. That's one of the best compliments I ever got in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Man. What was the most difficult part of seeing this particular script through? Or was there no difficulty? Did you, first of all, I'm going to ask, did you have an ending? Definitely an ending yeah, for ending. Act One. I had to have the ending, and the ending is the omniscient bartender, the one who believes he's F. Scott Fitzgerald. Poised at the end of the play, he has two drinks in his hands. He's never, even though he's a bartender, he has never taken alcohol. And I provide a reason why in the first act that he never touches the stuff, even though he serves it day in and day out, night in and night out. 
And is he going to drink? Because F. Scott Fitzgerald is the most celebrated alcoholic in American literature. And he wants to become Fitzgerald. And the hurdle, the final hurdle, they've got to put alcohol in your system. Because F. Scott Fitzgerald believed that he needed, Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald needed a notebook, a pencil or pen, and alcohol to drink. But he couldn't write without the three of them. No kidding. In fact, I quote him, I quote Fitzgerald in the play, where Fitzgerald actually said this. He said, for a long time I thought I could write about anything with just a notebook and a pen, and then I realized I also needed alcohol. So that must have been some type of a freeing agent for him psychologically. Possibly, yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Very interesting. So what's after this? Is there anything in the background, <laughs> or is this like your... <clears throat> I don't know. I'm not sure if I'll write another play about Thoreau. I'm really ringing <laughs> Thoreau's life uh, as much as I can, I suppose. But I have spent time contemplating Henry Thoreau and John Brown, the abolitionist. And they did meet. Uh, Thoreau heard him speak. So I had a whole afternoon of conversation with him. This is before John Brown uh, went to Harper's Ferry and attacked the arsenal there, um, the repercussions of that. This is American history again, um, race relations, etc. It could be a really strong play. Um, am I up for it? Yes, I am. <laughs> Will I do it? I don't know. I. Right now I'm taking a bit of a rest after doing Fitzgerald at your service. Did you say it took you two years to write this one? Yes, while I'm teaching it, it isn't that I could sit yeah. in my desk day after day, I had to work. I simply had to keep at it. Uh, I retired from teaching back in June of this year, 2019. I am now retired, but I don't know how to retire. I just keep working. <laughs> <laughs> and. I'm not sure what I'll be writing next. Um, my wife says, write a romantic comedy and make some money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've never thought about making money whenever I wrote it. It never occurred to me. Yeah, I think most artists don't really. Yeah, um, never occurred to me. Yeah. So how many iterations did you go through for this? This is basically the third draft, usually a third draft is when I feel I'm, I'm there. Yeah. And then there might be slight changes thereafter. But <clears throat> when I get to a third draft, usually there isn't much else I do. Um, I, re I stop writing a script when I come to the realization, at least I believe, I can't make it any better. I've done my best. I cannot add any improvement to the script. Mm -hmm. And when I reach that point, I find it's futile, really, to keep whacking away at the script, leave it alone, yeah. let others receive it. How long will you wait um, to hear from anyone in New York before you will release this into the wild and say, you know what, I, I really want to see this uh, play mounted on a stage somewhere? Well, again, Lisa is pretty industrious down in New York City, and she likes my work. I don't know how close she is to Broadway producers. I heard her work. She's self-employed, and she engages theater producers to do things. Uh, I'm not sure, really, what kind of work she does, but she does meet and talk and socialize with theater producers. <clears throat> One of them owns a theater, an off-Broadway theater. That would be nice if she could place this script in his hands. And then I guess a call before Christmas, what a gift that would be. Yeah, wouldn't it? And then the invitation, come on down. Yeah. Come on down, the Big Apple yeah. would like to receive you. That would be so cool. Yeah. Well, I would love to go down with you if that happens. Yes, you yeah. should come down and interview the producer. Yeah, I would <laughs> love to. I would Get really him on record. Yeah, yeah, I would really love to. So is there anything else you want to cover about this? Um, 
before no, we... it's just that I hope anybody out there who's hearing this podcast who's uh, paying attention to us, um, who has any interest in Fitzgerald at your service, the script, it's here. Again, I hold it up. Yeah. It's my trophy. <laughs> before we close out, Charles, um, since you have such a passion for writing, is there any one tip that you would give somebody who's thinking about writing something that besides come up with the ending first is well what I've learned over the years probably the most important thing and I it may pertain more to the theater than to other kinds of writing <clears throat> although I would suppose if you're a novelist you'd also pay attention to it is the audience my philosophy is the audience comes first. The audience is more important than the playwright. I don't know that the audience is more important than the actors on stage. I do know that when your play opens, you're best friends with the actors on stage, no doubt about it. But writing with the audience in mind, what does the audience know? What should they know at this interval? Uh, where do you want to take them? Do you want to make them laugh? How do you parcel out information? All of these are important questions, and if you don't have the audience in mind, you're not going to answer them adequately. So for me, uh, it's never a case of writing and bearing my soul. <clears throat> I'm not into that at all. If I bear my soul, it's by accident. The audience comes first, and I want them to have a wonderful time in the theater when I come to see anything of mine. Nice. Well said. Well, my friend, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming today. I hope all of these... Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Nah.